This is the first of three lectures looking at next generation sequencing technologies, their applications, and all the amazing things that you can now do with this huge flood of uh, sequencing data that is now becoming available. Today we're going to be really focusing on the sequencing technologies themselves, uh, with, later uh, with later lectures looking at the applications. And today we're really going to be looking at uh, sort of three different uh, aspects of these sequencing technologies. So looking at their evolution from the first generation, the, the kind of the original workhorse, which was Sanger sequencing, looking at second generation uh, sequencing technologies, so this high throughput sequencing, and then looking at third generation uh, sequencing technologies, which often are about sequencing individual single molecules of DNA. To start with, we're going to take a bit of a dive back into history and look at first generation sequencing. Although there were a number of sequencing methods that were developed, the, the primary one that has been used for a very long time is Sanger sequencing. This was developed by Fred Sanger in 1977. Um, it has several uh, variants uh, that have been used over time. Originally, it was uh, a sequencing method that was based on uh, gels. Uh, more recently, it's been based on capillaries and, and has been a bit more automated. But regardless of exactly how it's been implemented, Sanger sequencing has been the major workhorse for sequencing for at least the last uh, 30 or so years. Sanger sequencing was first introduced in this paper, uh, published in 1977 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in the United States. And uh, it's just been a major paper in the field. So uh, as scientists, we tend to measure uh, the influence of a paper by the number of times that other people have cited it. And this particular paper has had over 75,000 citations. Uh, to put this in perspective, you know, a pretty good paper might get 30 or 40. So this just serves to show just how influential this particular sequencing technology um, has been. This is material that you might have seen before if you've taken an introductory um, biology course, but, but let's go through it just to see if we can kind of get everyone on the same page. So um, with Sanger sequencing, you have these nucleotides uh, which are attached to often a, a fluorescently um, label. Uh, so different colors uh, for each of the four bases of the, of the DNA. So A, G, C, and T. Um, and there's also uh, a range of, of bases in there. So in the mix, you will have these um, DNTPs, these deoxynucleotides. Um, and those ones are not fluorescently labeled but they, um, they can be used to build up the chain. So these are just ordinary nucleotides, uh, pretty much the same as are found in, in living organisms. The, the special ones here are these so-called DDNTP nucleotides, these dideoxynucleotides. Um, these have the fluorescent marker label um, added to them, but they also have this, this difference shown in the gray box. So dideoxynucleotides have uh, an H, whereas deoxynucleotides have an OH. That OH group allows the growing DNA chain to extend, whereas this, the H group, means that the, the sequencing effectively stops. The, the, the strand can't add on a new nucleotide, and so you can't get any bigger. So what you've, you've got in this kind of set, setting is you've got some sort of original template, a, a DNA strand that you want to sequence, um, and you start building up the new sequence and these deoxynucleotides uh, start going in one by one so you build up your sequence gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then suddenly one of those dideoxynucleotides jumps in um, that ends the growing chain so because of that H group you can't extend it anymore but it also has this uh, fluorescent base so what you end up with is something that looks a bit like in this this lower left where you've got a whole range of fragments 
of different sizes, um, but one nucleotide size apart. And each of them is labeled on the end with a fluorescent um, marker indicating the type of nucleotide that has been put onto the very end. And so what you can do is you can run this out on a gel or uh, through a capillary. And by shining fluorescent, um, by, by shining a laser light on those fluorescent markers, you get a bit of an indication of, of what nucleotide is there. So you can kind of read down a bit like a barcode. You can scan down here. So G, uh, because it shines as a, as a blue, the next one is yellow. So that's a T, then, then three red. So that's an AAA. And so by looking at those colors, you can basically read off the sequence. The first human genome sequence was developed in exactly this way. So it took a long time to develop, so 13 years from 1990 till uh, the draft genomes really came out, or the nice, fairly finished genomes came out in 2003. And this took a huge amount of effort. So thousands of researchers from dozens of countries, um, and it cost about three billion US dollars. Um, but it was all really done with this, this Sanger sequencing. And so if you worked um, at the time in an organization that was doing some of the sequencing, you would have seen effectively big factories like this one. So uh, what we're looking at here is a, a Sanger sequencing machine, but an entire row of them uh, right down here on a factory floor. And then as you can see by the number that's highlighted, um, you know, this is machines number 387 through to 397. So there are just hundreds and hundreds of these machines on a factory floor and you've got technicians sort of walking up and down, taking sequences off, putting sequences on. Um, and so very much a, a non sort of automated way, or if it is automated, it's very much a manual sort of automation. Um, but of course it worked, you know, we managed to get the human genome this way. But obviously it's not the best way of doing things. And so times have changed a little bit. And the big change was with the development of the so-called second generation sequencing, uh, which has got a number of particular characteristics. So the sort of next generation or second generation sequencing can refer to quite a number of different products that we'll look at in a little bit. But the first of them really came into the market in 2004, uh, and they really sort of took off in the late 2000s. And they're all characterized by this, uh, by, by high throughput methods, uh, especially this miniaturization and automation. And the sheer amount of data that these technologies um, allowed led to a major change in biology. So this is a figure showing basically the cost for a million bases of DNA sequence over time. So if you look back uh, to the early 2000s, so this is really back in the, the Sanger days, the, there were technologies, um, they changed and they advanced, but fairly slowly, right? So the, the, the cost of sequencing decreased, but it was a bit of a linear trend, or at least on this log scale, it's a linear trend. And it's quite interesting that it, it mirrors Moore's law, which is the... Um, the computing equivalent where basically the cost of a, a CPU chip um, halves every 18 months. So basically you can fit more and more transistors onto a computer chip and therefore the price gets cheaper and cheaper. And so you've, you saw the same kind of trend um, with, with Sanger sequencing. But you'll notice that the really striking difference on this particular graph occurred in the mid-2000s, uh, so about 2007, 2008, where there is a marked drop in the cost uh, of a million bases of DNA. And that was the advent of these second generation technologies. Now, that, that increase, um, or the, rather the decrease in cost, uh, has sort of plateaued again. So since about 2015, the cost of the sequencing, if anything, has been a bit flat. Um, but nonetheless, it was a major revolution because it meant that we could suddenly start getting DNA sequence data very, very fast, very, very cheaply, and you could begin to ask a whole lot of new biological questions with it.
And so in the previous slide, we looked at cost. And here we're really looking at um, the amount of data that you can generate. And that has also changed over time. So if you look back at about 1980, so soon after Fred Sanger developed his method, uh, Sanger sequencing was done very much in a manual way on slab gels and using uh, radioactive markers and x-rays. Um, by the, by the 90s, that was beginning to get automated, so there were slab gels that were automated. And the real big advances were occurring in the late 90s, early 2000s with capillary sequencing. So instead of running your DNA out through some sort of gel, you, you ran it through a tube. So basically like a very, very thin straw that contained um, a, a mixture of compounds that meant that effectively works like a gel, but it's just uh, miniaturized. And then you have uh, the second generation capillary sequences where the technology is improved. And then about you know, 20, 2008, you start getting these improved uh, second generation sequencing uh, methods, these massively parallel sequencing methods. So microwell pyro sequencing was one of the first one, then these short read sequences, and of course now you are to, uh, to single molecule sequencing. And so the trend has been the ability to get huge amounts of DNA um, per unit of time. So we're rapid increase in the amount of DNA you can get for the same amount of time. If this is something that you're interested in, this paper gives a pretty good overview. So uh, Van Dijkenel uh, wrote about next generation sequencing technologies and looked at a number of different, uh, different technologies and how they work and compared it to what had sort of been previously available. Uh, so it's worth a read if this is something that interests you. There is not just one sequencing technology available. There's a whole plethora of them. So uh, the first technology to really take off about 2004 was something called 454 sequencing, um, uh, introduced by Roche. And that was the first really high throughput sequencing technology that was available. In the, in the late uh, 2000s, uh, the Illumina sequencing technology began to uh, appear on the market. And that one has turned out to be long lasting. So most of the short read sequencing that is done at the present time is done using the Illumina technology. And we're gonna be looking at that technology a little bit uh, later in the seminar. But there have been lots of other technologies that have also uh, appeared on the market. So Ion Torrent came onto the market about 2010. Uh, the advantage of this was it was incredibly fast sequencing uh, method. So you could get DNA sequence really quickly. And then more recently, there have been these handheld devices such as Oxford Nanopore, uh, where you can, instead of having to have a, you know, a, a big machine to do your sequencing, you've got a, a small machine about the size of a cell phone, plugs into the USB port of your laptop, and you can kind of sequence anywhere you like. Um, so a lot of different technologies out there. Um, and it's, we're going to explore a few of these just to give a bit of a feeling for what these technologies are and what their differences um, uh, have been from each other. And we're going to start just very, very quickly by this technology, uh, which interestingly is no longer around, right? So you might, might say why we're going to look at it, but I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. So this is a so-called solid technology. And it's really interesting in that whereas most of the other technologies are based on, two nucle uh, on, a, on a single nucleotide, the solid technology is based on two nucleotides. Um, and so what you end up with is the so-called color space coding. And I don't really want to go into this in too much detail, um, other than to, to point out that if you have a genuine change or difference in your nucleotide sequence, then you get this pattern on the right, where you get that change being represented uh, by two color changes. So in that uh, square box, you've got, if you look up and down, you've got the blue and the red, and then next to it, you've got the yellow and the green. So that's a very clear uh, double count, as it were, of the SNP. Whereas if there's just an error, you know, you're just making a measurement error, which is really, really common, um, then you only see one of these changes. So that's the box on the left, where you've only got the blue and the red. And I, I just mentioned this because uh, 
this uh, method is incredibly powerful. It was, in fact, a much more accurate and in many ways better method than the Illumin technology or some of the other technologies. And yet, this uh, technology is no longer available. Um, effectively went out of business. So it's important to remember that uh, just because um, just because some companies managed to survive the market forces, you know, so Illumina has done very well and this particular company did not, does not necessarily mean that we're using the best sequencing technologies. Uh, it just means that market forces prevail and some technologies win and some don't. But there are things to learn from looking at some of these older technologies. So this is really just a, a very quick warning that on the next few slides I'm going to be talking about a number of different sequencing technologies. The, the intent here is not that you have to learn every single little detail, right? What I'm trying to get across is the main differences between these different technologies, uh, what their benefits are, what the disadvantages are, and give you a little bit of a flavor for the different ways in which people have approached the problem of how do we sequence DNA uh, quickly and fast uh, because there's lots of different ways to do it. So as you go over the next few slides, just focus on the concepts. Don't get too bogged down in the detail. The first technology we want to talk about uh, is the Illumina sequencing technology, um, which has become a, a major workhorse. This is a kind of data that you're likely to come across uh, very, very commonly. Um, it's often called sequencing by synthesis. It's based on the generation of a light signal, which you'll uh, recognize as a recurrent theme, um, and it is highly parallelized. Um, one of its unique features is that it is one base at a time, and we'll look at a few different technologies further on where that's not necessarily the case. So, Illumina sequencing is really based on this idea of reversible terminators. So, if we think back to, um, to the Sanger sequencing, we had those uh, dideoxynucleotides, right? They, they stuck on the end of a growing chain of, of DNA, and then you couldn't add any more nucleotides, right? So they were, those were terminators, but they weren't reversible. Once you put on one of those dideonucleotides, uh, that was it. The chain was ended. Uh, Illumina does things slightly different. So here what we've got is a little cluster of um, identical, nu uh, yeah, identical nucleotide DNA sequences. So they've basically been generated by a method that's very, very similar to PCR. It's not quite like that, but very similar. So a little cluster of sequences that should be um, identical. And then what you do is you wash over nucleotides that contain, uh, that contain fluorescent labels. So again, this is very similar to Sanger sequencing, which also used fluorescent labels. So you, you wash it over. Um, and then one nucleotide gets incorporated, whatever the next nucleotide is. So you can then shine a light on that, again a laser light, and you can figure out for this particular cluster what is the, um, the fluorescent uh, light signal that you're getting off, and from that you can begin to figure out what the nucleotide is that was put onto that particular cluster. And then the novelty for this, and where it differs from Sanger sequencing, is that you can cleave off that dye group, right? So you wash that away, it's no longer fluorescent, but you also uh, cleave off the terminating groups, which means you can now repeat the cycle and, and put on one more nucleotide. And so you can repeat this over and over again to build up the growing chain and determine what the nucleotide you have added at each step in this process. So in other words, this is effectively some sort of sequential fluorescence, right? So if we look at the first cycle, so here we're looking at uh, that black box has got two different clusters in it, and we're going to be building up the sequence of both of them as we go. So if we look at the first cycle, uh, the lower cluster has got uh, a green fluorescence, and so that's a C. The upper cluster has got a yellow fluorescence, so that's a G. In the next cycle, both of them glow with a, a red 
uh, fluorescence, and so that's both T. In the third cycle, it's a, a G and an A. In the fourth cycle, it's a T and an A. And in the fifth cycle, it's a G and an A. So what you can do is you can go through these photographs after the fact, and you can basically read off the sequence. So that top cluster has got a sequence of G, T, A, A, A. The bottom cluster has got a sequence of uh, C, T, G, T, C. And the trick to this, though, is that you don't just look at one or two clusters, but it's uh, everything is miniaturized and, and all of these clusters are packed in. So this is an example of um, this particular sequencing technology, actually from the very early days. So if you look on the left, you can see all these little clusters. Um, and by looking at the, the colors that are coming off, you can figure out what uh, nucleotide has been incorporated at each particular cluster. Now on the left, that's an old version, so you can see there's lots of empty sort of dark space. The technologies have improved a lot more now, and so if you look on the right, you give a bit of an indication about how much you can begin to pack in some of these clusters. And this is why you can get uh, so much cheap sequencing, because uh, you can just basically sequence huge numbers of DNA molecules um, on a very, very small amount of, of real estate. So the, the, the chips on which these are done are really, really small. And it's kind of interesting when you look at this uh, technology, you see where we've had to kind of steal ideas from. So I don't know if you look at these, these images and they, they remind you of other things, but to me, they remind me of stars. And in fact, the technology used to um, the software used to look at these images and identify not only where the points are, but also their colors, was actually taken mostly from astronomy, right? So these technologies in terms of uh, automating DNA sequencing have largely been taken from other technologies that have been developed in different fields of science. And just like the factories with Sanger sequencing machines, Illumina machines are now the new workhorse. So you can go into uh, big sequencing centers and they will have a lot of Illumina machines lined up just like in this, this image. So again, uh, lots of machines doing the job. The difference is that each of these machines now churns out huge amounts of DNA sequence data. So vastly more than that the entire factory would have been available uh, to do for that Sanger sequencing. Uh, so the idea is very similar. The amount of DNA that has been generated is much, much bigger. And then we can move on to this idea of third generation sequencing, which is really where things are going, particularly into the future. So one such technology uh, is iron torrent. Um, and this isn't actually used very much anymore. It's, it's still in production and it still is being used, but it's not particularly common. But I want to talk about it because it's quite a different kind of technology to the ones that we've been talking about. So iron torrent is sequencing by pH. So what this method does is it effectively uh, generates an electrical signal. So an electrical signal, not a light signal. Um, but again, it's highly parallelized. Um, the difference from Illumina sequencing is that now in the third generation sequencing, we're talking about sequencing single DNA molecules. Uh, so we're all looking at single molecule sequencing. Uh, but again, this is one base type at a time. Uh, Illumina it was a single base at a time. This is one base type, as we'll see uh, in a few moments. So iron torrent works on this idea of pH. So what we've got here is a, a silicon uh, wafer, um, which is basically the, the foundation of computer chips, right? So it's, it's really no different from that. Um, but on it, it's got millions and millions of these sensors. So if you look at the bottom image, there's all these little wells, and then there's material underneath it. So each one of those wells is effectively a little independent pH meter. And then it's all wrapped up um, in this thing on the top right, which is uh, also got a computer chip. 
so um, basically this is sequencing on a, a silicon computer chip. The way ion tyrant sequencing works is by detecting hydrogen ions. So um, if you recall your chemistry, pH, so changing things from either acid to, to basic, um, is really all about the availability of hydrogen ions. So what we've got here is we've got uh, one of these wells, which we just saw in the previous figure, um, and underneath it we've got um, this the sensor, effectively the pH sensor, which connects to a silicon computer chip. So the, the DNA molecule sits in the well, the nucleotides come in, as a nucleotide gets incorporated, it releases a hydrogen ion. And this, this miniature pH meter uh, recognizes that hydrogen ion, and then uh, gives a signal to the computer chip. And so what you do is you run over um, a single nucleotide type at a time. So you, first of all, you run over your A's, and then you wash it all off, then you run over your G's, and you wash it all off, and you look for the signal. And so this is the kind of thing that you get um, coming out of, of this technology. So if you look from the left, uh, you've, you've run over um, a T, and there was no signal, then you ran over A's, and suddenly you do get a signal, right? So you get that that peak of uh, that peak of green. Then you ran over a C, then a G, no signal for those. Then you run over a T, and you do get a signal, right? So by looking through this, you can begin to read off what the sequence is. Now, some of these peaks are larger than others. And that just indicates that uh, there are strings of bases of the same type. Um, so that you might have, if you look at the, the first big red peak, um, you might have up, up to sort of 12 or 13 bases of T's in a row. Um, but this can be a little bit challenging. So when you think about it, if you look at the example with the arrow, so that, that peak of, of black, or, which is indicating a run of G's, now that indicates that there are about 13 G's in a row. But the question is, well, are there 13? Or are there 12? Or are there 14? And often it's very, very hard to tell. So these runs of a single nucleotide are called homopolymer runs, and they tend to be a bit uncertain in terms of estimation from DNA sequence. So uh, this particular technology, so uh, ion torrent, can have problems with homopolymer runs. They tend not to be such an issue with um, technologies like Illumina. Which begs the question then, well, why would you use a technology like Ion Torrent and not just use something like Illumina? So if you look at the cost per base, uh, Illumina is much cheaper. It costs about five cents per megabase. Ion Torrent uh, costs about a dollar. Um, you can also get a lot more data with Illumina technology. So you get about three billion reads for a run on Illumina, only about 40 million uh, for Ion Torrent. But the big differences are in the size and the speed. So uh, Illumina, you can only really go up to about 250 base pairs. Uh, you can get a bit longer than that, but not too much longer before the error rates start uh, going through the roof. Whereas with Iron Torrent, you can get much longer sequences. So it'd be quite common to get uh, lengths of, of reads of about 400 base pairs. But the really important difference is the speed. So Illumina, uh, with all those washing steps and, and the rest of it, uh, it takes a few days in order to run a chip. There are now uh, chips that will run much more quickly, but we're still talking about sort of 12 hours or, or something of that type. With Ion Torrent, you can get the results out in about two hours. And so the major benefit of Ion Torrent was its speed. There was a major outbreak of E. coli in Europe uh, a few years back, just when this technology was coming out. Within 24 hours, uh, the genome of that pathogen had been sequenced and the genes had been identified. And so people had a pretty good indication about um, what sort of treatments might work against that particular E. coli strain and which ones wouldn't. Uh, so that was really the first example of real-time sequencing where an outbreak happened, uh, the sequencing was done, and that information was then used to feedback to clinicians, you know, how do we actually treat the patients that we're, we're still seeing coming to the clinic? Uh, 
as opposed to a lot of the previous sequencing, which had really been um, picking apart the, the infection long after it had ceased to be a problem. So um, this was really the first example of where next generation sequencing kind of made a real difference in real time uh, for a major uh, outbreak. The other thing I just want to note at this point, now that we're looking at the number of reads and, and the size of the reads, is just how much data uh, these technologies are generating. So a single flow cell of Illumina could easily be about a terabyte of, of data. Um, so that's about the size of a, of a hard drive. Um, a hard drive is perhaps maybe three or four terabytes these days. Uh, one terabyte is the amount of data just of one flow cell of Illumina. Um, to put that in perspective, it's equivalent to about 50 copies of the Lord of the Rings DVD set. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of data, and that means that you've got to be able to analyze it. Um, and increasingly, the challenge has gone not from generating the sequencing data in the first place to actually figuring out what can you do with this data once you've got it. There's another technology that I want to talk a little bit about. Again, a third generation sequencing technology. So it sequences individual um, molecules of DNA. And that is uh, this PacBio or Pacific Biosciences uh, technology. It's commonly called PacBio. Um, this is really interesting in that it is real time sequencing. And we'll look at a bit in a moment about uh, what this means. Um, again, we're, we're looking at generating a light signal, so we're kind of back into that same sort of framework as Illumina or Sanger sequencing. Again, you'll not be surprised to hear that it's highly parallelized, so we're sequencing lots of DNA molecules at the same time. And uh, we're back to sequencing one base at a time, although in a slightly different framework to the ones uh, we've looked at previously. This is an example of a PacBio uh, sequencing machine. Uh, there are not too many of these around the world, but they have a lot of high throughput. So um, it doesn't really matter where you are based as long as you can get a service provider to run the sequencing for you. This particular technology is quite interesting in that it is very, very sensitive to movement. So, this particular machine is often put on a great big slab of granite, so a big slab of stone, so it doesn't move very much. It's uh, not very uh, comfortable with earthquakes, as you might guess. So how does PacBio sequencing work, right? So uh, again, we have this kind of framework where we've got a, a, a chip and in it, it's got a whole lot of these wells. And the really interesting thing about this is that the wells are so small that light cannot pass through from the top of this, uh, this uh, chip through to the bottom of it. So on the top of this chip, you've got all your solution with your nucleotides and your DNA and all the other things. At the bottom of the chip, you've got your detectors. So basically looking at the bottom of each well and they're looking for a light signal. But none of the stuff from the top of the, um, the, the, the chip, so all those fluorescent markers, none of that can actually leak through into the fluorescent detection. The other thing to note here is you've got uh, this interesting thing where you've got a polymerase, uh, so a DNA polymerase that is tethered to the bottom of this well. Um, and this allows you to do direct sequencing. And so basically we're looking at direct sequencing uh, via a polymerase. So how does this method work? It's, it's again all based on this idea of pulses of light um, set off by fluorescent markers. So what you've got is you've got your polymerase, that, that green uh, semicircular thing tethered at the bottom of the well, a, a random DNA molecule drifts into the well and the polymerase starts to sequence it. Now as it sequences it, it, in, it incorporates these nucleotides and the nucleotides have got these fluorescent labels. So uh, in this particular case, uh, G has got this, this blue label, 
A has got this orange one, T is the green, and then C has got a red label. And so as you look uh, through your detector, through the bottom of this well over time, you see some sort of level of background noise. Okay, that's the, the, the different colors sort of dribbling around at the bottom of that graph. And then as a nucleotide gets incorporated, in this particular case it's a G, then you get this pulse of light. Um, and that signal is recorded, and then it drops away as that fluorescent marker uh, drifts back out into the main solution. And so what you end up with is something that looks like this. And so what we've got here is uh, a, a readout from just one of these wells, so a single well in this pack bio technology. And we're looking at fluorescent intensity and the types of uh, nucleotides that are incorporated. So if you look at the um, either of these graphs really, but the one at the bottom or the one at the top, then you can see as, as you move along, you can see the nucleotides giving off a fluorescent signal and being counted. So if we look at the one at the top, for instance, you can see there's a flash of the green, so that's a T, a flash of uh, orange, so that's a C, another flash of green, that's a T, and so you can just read off the sequence, right? Uh, so T, C, T, G, A, and so on and so forth. What I want to sort of highlight here um, is just the time frames that we're talking about. So if you look at the the picture on the bottom there, that uh, is a signal that has been um, captured in just over one minute. And so if we look um, at this kind of technology, it's, it's literally a real-time sequencing, unlike the previous ones where you've had to be sequencing, uh, you know, and it might take 12 hours to get the results in, or even two hours in the case of that ion torrent, these sequences really are being generated in real time. And so what you can get here with this particular technology are read lengths of the order of, say, 1,500 base pairs. And in fact, you can get ones that are much, much longer than that now. And you can get them at a speed of about 10 bases per second. Um, that's quite interesting because the that's actually slow for a polymerase. So if you think of a normal polymerase that's acting in your cell, it can sequence, uh, well, can generate DNA sequence much, much more quickly than that. Um, it can replicate DNA uh, because it kind of has to, right? So your cells can replicate uh, very, very fast. If you think of an E. coli cell, the entire DNA complement of an E. coli cell can be replicated uh, in 20, 20 minutes. Um, and so most polymerases are actually really fast. So these particular polymerases that are put into the bottom of these packed bio wells have actually been uh, engineered to be really, really slow. They have to be slow enough that you can actually see this fluorescent signal. Um, the other thing to note here is that unlike some of the other technologies, uh, such as Illumina, which tends to have a very high um, accuracy rate, with pack bio the error rates tend to be quite high. So they can be as high as 10 to 15% error rates. And you can see that in the sequences here. So if you look at that top sequence, um, there's a couple of lowercase letters that haven't been particularly well captured. So uh, T, C, T, G, A. And then actually the next bit of that sequence is meant to be a T, uh, which hasn't been captured very well. So the benefit of this technology is that you get very long reads, uh, now into thousands and thousands of base pairs. Uh, you can sequence it very, very fast, but the downside is that the error rates are low. In contrast, the old Illumina technology, uh, accuracy rates are very, very high, um, but the read lengths are very small, and uh, the, the speed is also very, very low. So it's a trade-off. What do you need for a particular use uh, application? But I do really just want to hammer home this idea of real-time sequencing and give you a bit of an indication of what that means. So what we're looking at here is uh, not longer just one cell, but hundreds of, of these cells on a PacBio slide. 
right? So each of these dots of light represents a different will. And in a moment, I'm going to play this video and we'll be able to see that uh, the sequencing happening in real time. So this video hasn't been sped up or slowed down. Each little flash of light that you see for each of these wills is an incorporation of a new nucleotide and um, an indication of a new nucleotide being incorporated into that sequence. So let's take a quick look at what this video looks like. And I think this just hammers home the point that we've moved back from the Sanger sequencing, which was very, very slow, to those second generation technologies that were really fast. And here in this third generation technologies, we're looking at sequencing of an individual DNA molecule. And you can see how fast those flashes of light are happening. Each one of those is a new nucleotide uh, along that DNA sequence. So you can suddenly get data really, really quickly um, in a way that we, we weren't able to just a few years ago. So there's been a lot of information in the seminar. So what are the main take-home messages here? What, what should you be learning and, and keeping in mind from what we've talked about after the, over the last little while? I guess I would make a number of points here. The first is that sequencing technologies are changing very, very rapidly. So Sanger sequencing was around for about uh, 30 or 40 years, still being used, of course. Um, but the new technologies have really only come in in the last 10 to 15 years. And they've been changing pretty rapidly in the last sort of five years or so. Um, you should expect that change to continue and to increase um, over the next 10 to 20 years. The second point is that data sets are now really big. They're, they're absolutely enormous. And that has led to a bit of a difference in the way that we have to deal with biology. So in many ways, biology is becoming a bit like physics. We now have to deal with very, very large data sets of the, of the size that, that physicists are used to dealing with in terms of quantum mechanics and, um, and astronomy. Uh, and that in turn means that biologists uh, have to get really good with using uh, good computer systems and programming and bioinformatics. The third point I would make is that uh, high throughput sequencing is now routine. Whereas it was a bit uh, experimental and edgy 10 years ago, you will now find high throughput sequencing um, in almost every biological laboratory. Uh, it does depend on the question, but certainly if you have anything to do with genetics or uh, genetic questions, then almost certainly you're going to encounter this high throughput uh, sequencing data. Because this data is now very, very common, we're being able to ask all sorts of new questions and, and apply this sort of data to all sorts of new applications. And so the question then becomes, well, what can we do with all these data sets? What questions can we ask? What new applications can we employ? And in the second of this uh, series of lectures, uh, we're going to be looking at exactly that sort of question. So next generation sequencing is a really important topic. Uh, we've come a long way from the Sanger sequencing of the 1970s, and things are changing very, very fast. Uh, but certainly if you're interested in, in biology and genetics and are interested in terms of where this field is going, the next generation sequencing is a really important topic for you to keep an eye on.